going to go to run some lunch around that school. Just say real loud this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Yes. 
And if anyone hasn't heard uh, earlier, uh, very early this morning, uh, Brother Sonny's mother-in-law, Miss Susan's mother, passed away about 1 o'clock this morning and slipped uh, out of this world and into the portals of glory because she needs Jesus Christ. And we need to make sure we have that same knowledge and same assurance in our own situations. And you can be sure through what God's holy word says. And everybody say it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God in heaven, we love you and thank you. We ask that you wrap all the families up that have prayer requests and those that have special situations and things going on, Lord, in your arms of mercy and grace, Lord, we pray your will be done tonight during this time of worship, celebration. We pray that you'd be with Brother Chip as he comes to bring the message in just a few moments as well. Speak to our hearts and draw us close to your side. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time. Can you do that for me? I love this song. This song's been around a long time. Shout to the Lord.
Well, praise the Lord. Good to hear voices lifted up and praise and adoration of the Lord tonight. Amen? Amen. I'm so thankful that all of you are here and uh, we appreciate your attendance. I have a special guest tonight. And uh, Brother John Bug down here on the front row, preacher and uh, fellow chaplain in the racing world. He was chaplain over at Newport Speedway for a long time. And I'm so glad he's come to be with us tonight. I hope you'll shake his hand after the service and make him welcome. And for those of you who might be guests uh, here tonight, thank you for coming. And then the home folks, appreciate your faithful attendance. Let's get right into the message of the Word of God. I want to say to you tonight, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. I want to be very clear at, about tonight's message. Uh, tonight we're going to preach from the text and in no way stretch the text. But I'm going to use an illustration from the racing world to illustrate the text. I've got to confess with you, uh, I'm very much, if you haven't figured it out already, I'm very much concerned with making sure that I preach what God says, not what somebody else says. Amen. Especially not what I have to say, but what the text says. And uh, let me tell you how this message came about. I was asked to speak at a men's meeting one time. And, uh, the, of course, men, you know, being men, you know, typically tough and rugged. Of course, nowadays, you know, people are crazy enough to say that being masculine is a sickness. It's not a sickness. But if being masculine is your God, then you're spiritually sick. Hello? You catch up my slow friend sooner or later. Men ought to be men and not be afraid to be men. But being rough and rugged is not the end all of being a man. Being submissive to God is the end all of man. That's what God wants. Submission to Him. And it doesn't matter if you lift 500 pounds or 5 pounds as long as your heart is submissive to Him and obedient to Him. That's what's most important. But in that men's meeting, I prayed and I said, Lord, what do I do? And I had told a couple of flagmen that I worked with in the racing world that I wanted to set a racing flags to be able to use them as an illustration. And uh, these flags, I don't know how many races they were used in, but a flagman said, I've got you a set. A lot of times when I come walking in to, if, I, if the Lord puts it on my heart to preach this text and I use the flags, uh, people think I'm carrying a pool stick around with me. That's what I carry the flags in, that little case. But uh, I had no intention of ever preaching this message in, in a revival meeting, but it, God used it that night. And, I was preaching over in Wartburg, Tennessee. Y'all know where that's at, don't you? Yeah, several of you were locked up there, I can tell. But anyway, uh, over in Wartburg one night, I just felt like the Lord laid it on my heart at the last second to preach this message and illustrate it with the flags. And I, I don't know if it'll be a blessing to you, but I know this. I know this, that God has a word from us from His Word. And so if you're physically able to stand out of respect to the reading of God's Word, would you join me in verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. We'll read the first three verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Brother John, would you mind praying for us? Father, we thank you, Lord, that we serve the living God. Lord, we pray that you anoint this sermon. We thank you, Lord, that you went that over your cross and shed your precious blood Amen. for me. Lord, I pray for this church. Anoint it with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm proud of you. Save my soul. Lord, I ask you to help us to uh, take this message and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you. Can be seated. People hear that when I, I serve as a racing chaplain, and uh, they ask, "What do I do?" Well, my role is a little bit different from some chaplains. Uh, NASCAR chaplains they don't do uh, everything that I get involved in, but it's a different scenario. I did serve at a NASCAR track in in South Carolina. I, I simplify it this way. Brother John did a lot of what I, I do as well. I, I, I tell people that I, I preach to the, the drivers and the crew members. I, I'm blessed to be able to have a chapel service with our series. I'm able to take the Word of God and open the Bible and have about a 10 to 15 minute chapel service. About, about as long as you can pull off in, uh, in our series is about 10 to 15 minutes. And if we ever have a bad accident during practice, you've got to make it a five minute message. You say, well, that's not, that's not too effective. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Word of God, if it's a one minute message, the Word of God is still powerful. And you just share the Word and, and uh, tell people about Jesus and trust the Holy Spirit to do His work. But I, I, I preach to them. I pray for them. I pray for them at the track. I, I pray for them away from the track. I go and visit them in the hospital when I can. I've gone to funerals. I preach the funeral of the owner of our series. His dad passed away. And I've had an opportunity to go and share the gospel with him and make sure that uh, he was right with the Lord. And uh, was able to, to, to console the family with that. And I'll tell you, that man had not lived a Christian life. And he had to get right with God. But at least he got right with God before he passed away. That's not the ideal situation. We ought to, we ought to be right with God the moment the Spirit of God draws us. We ought to respond right then. We ought to be as Paul said, today is the day of salvation. Calvin did not do that. And he, with much brokenness that day as I talked to him, admitted that he had, he had sinned greatly and had to get that right with God and believe on the Lord Jesus. So I pray with them at the track, away from the track, and then I help protect them. Well, John would get a kick out of this. We were laughing before we started tonight. On race day, I usually run by the gym if I can, at least the day before, and lift a few weights, and I'll put some on social media that says I'm getting ready for the race. For me as a chaplain, I can't stand idly by and watch two men beat each other's brains out. <laughs> and when you're six foot four and four hundred under your business pounds, you step in between the five. In fact, last year, I think it was last year, no year before last, I'm standing at Anderson Motor Speedway with one driver with literally my hand around his throat here and another driver with my hand around his throat here and about 30 people around me trying to hold those two drivers apart like that. I don't want them to get hurt, so I step in and try to finish the stuff. Not every chaplain does that. That's just the role I have. And then I flip over, and I'm official during the race. I pre-tech vehicles and uh, weigh them before they get out there, make sure they don't have 100-pound Pepsi cans. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll explain it after the service. <laughs> and then during the race, I'm the pit row official. You, if you jump the gun on the start flag, I'm the one that calls you back. I radio to the tower and say, call them back. And so a lot of stuff I get involved with. And, and in all of that experience, the more racing I worked around, the more I looked at the Word of God and thought about Hebrews chapter 12, the more I realized that there is an illustration that, that I can use with these flags to help us to understand the text. I personally believe it was Luke that penned the book of Hebrews under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You may believe it's Paul. You may believe it was Apollos. It really doesn't matter. All we know is that the book of Hebrews is the Word of God. Amen. And probably if Luke did pen it, it was with the heavy ins the heavy influence of the Apostle Paul. And when he got to chapter 12 and verse number 1, he makes a reference to running the race. Running the race. In verse number 1 when he says, run the race with patience. Or run with patience the race that is set before you. And someone might be sitting there saying, Preacher, when I listen, I, I'm not so for sure he had stock car racing in mind. Well, let me ask you a question. What kind of racing did he have in mind? I mean, we know that in the 
We know that in the, uh, the Bible there is the foot race. But we also know that in the Bible there was chariot racing. As in wheels and horsepower. <laughs> Rolling wheels and horsepower. Truth of the matter is it doesn't matter if it was a foot race, a chariot race, or it was a NASCAR race. We know that in the Bible on multiple occasions racing is used to illustrate spiritual truth. And it just so happens in that racing environment, I saw more and more a way to illustrate what God was saying. And all I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to follow the example of the Lord Jesus. Because when he would preach quite often, he would, put, he would pick up something. Well, I remember one message, and you do too if you've read the Bible much, where he took a little child and set a little child on his lap and talked about how the kingdom of God was like a little child and said, unless you become like one of these children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. On another occasion, he picked up a, a tumbleweed, we'll call it, and illustrated that with a tumbleweed. He was constantly taking things in the world around him that the people related to and illustrating his truth, which is the only truth. Amen. He was the living word. And he was preaching the word. He, he, was, he is what the whole Bible is all about. So as we look at this book of Hebrews and we consider the race that is set before us, let me say very, from the very beginning that God has a race for all believers to run. Amen. Every Christian has a purpose. Every Christian is in the plan of God. The purpose that God has for you is for you to live the Christian life intentionally. And he uses on more than one occasion the imagery of you and me as Christians running the race. Now I know quite likely there would be some here tonight that are not Christians. You have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting and turning to Him. And I want to say to you from the onset that the Lord has graciously allowed you to come so that you can be reminded tonight that God does love you, that He sent His Son Jesus to die for you, to be buried and rise in resurrection victory, and He can save you no matter what your past is like. He desires to save you, and He desires for you to be in His race. Let me just say, not only is there a purpose in the fact that God has a race for us to run, but the race is His possession. Now, whenever you go to a race, a stock car race, for me, it's asphalt racing. I love dirt track racing as well. I like any kind of racing that goes round and round. And every now and then, the kind that goes back and forth and even straight. In fact, if I can find two frogs that will race, I'll watch it and enjoy it. Amen? But, but nonetheless... Nonetheless, we got to understand that when you show up at a racetrack to watch a race, there is an owner of that race. A lot of people think that the guy on the flag stand is in charge of the race. He's not in charge of that race. He's one of the officials in that race, but he's not in charge. There is someone who owns that particular race. It may be at Volunteer Speedway, and Volunteer Speedway has an owner. But uh, that owner may lease the track out to a racing series, and that racing series has an owner. For us, it's the Southeast Super Truck Series. We'll run Kingsport twice this year. We'll run Tri-County four times this year. We'll run Hickory twice. We'll run Anderson Motor Speedway three times this year. And Jeff Myers and Diane Miller, they are the co-owners of every individual race. You know what that means? That means they're in charge. It's not the drivers that are in charge. It's not the sponsors that are in charge. It's not the crew members. It's not us officials. It's not me as a chaplain. You see, the owner is in charge of the race. And if we don't get anything out of this, we need to remember this tonight. If we are a believer, we are in a race, good or bad. We are in a race. And it is not a race where we determine the rules. 
It is not a race where we own it and we can tell God what to do and we can live it the way that we want to live it. No, the Christian life is to be lived in humble submission to the Lord. Amen. Our head tech is Chad Hunter. He and Jeff Myers are talking tonight, probably right now, discussing the final plans of our rule book for this season. Chad's not the owner. He's the head tech. He's involved in making sure that the rules of the race are communicated clearly because Jeff Myers, the owner, has a, a plan. He owns it. And God owns our race. You say, well, where's his rule book? He blessed us to give us his holy word. Amen. And it doesn't matter how you feel or what you think or what your great grandma thought or, you know, whatever. A lot of people have a lot of wild ideas. I had somebody the day look at me and say, you know, I'm open to Christianity, but I, the way I see it is, uh, you know, really and truly, I think there's some good in all religions. And so I sort of take all of them and mesh them together. Well, my friend, I got a question for you if you think that. Who told you you could do that? The Bible says in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven. The man that owns the race laid out all the rules. He determined how it's all to be played and run. And we are not to try to tell him how to do it. We are to live in humble submission before the Lord. Notice he says in this text, seeing we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. A lot of people go to a race and they realize or they need to realize there's an owner. And unfortunately, many people think that whenever you see a great cloud of witnesses, they think that that's grandma sitting in heaven looking over the portals watching. And they equate in their mind the crowd watching the race at the race. That's got to be the great cloud of witnesses. I just want to say something to you. That's not the imagery in Hebrews chapter 12. I hate to disappoint you if you think grandma's leaning over glory watching you. I hate to disappoint you and tell you this, but my dad passed away in 2003, and I tell you right now, if my dad's watching from heaven, he shed many a tear what's going on down here. You say, well, who in the world are those great cloud of witnesses? We'll talk about that in just a second. Now notice he says there's a great cloud of witnesses. There is people. There's a plan. God's the owner. There's people. The great cloud of witnesses that we will hear from in, uh, in just a little bit. Then he says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Now, if you would pay attention with me to the flags just for a few moments and well through the rest of the message. Whenever you see a race, you'll see this flag come out. This flag is the, the caution flag. You'll see it wave at the beginning of a race. After they sing the national anthem, after the jets fly over if it's NASCAR, if, if it's super trucks, uh, after I pray and the national anthem is sung, and that all the drivers are strapped into their cars, you'll see the flag and pull out the yellow flag and you'll wave it. And you know what that's a symbol? That's a symbol for them to start their cars around the track. Real simple. You'll see them going around the track and, and they'll be going about 40 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour, and there'll be a pace truck out in front of it. You know what they are doing at that time? They're preparing for the race. There is a time of preparation. Now you may be sitting there watching a race and you see them after a while, they'll start weaving back and forth in that race. Weaving back and forth. They are not drunk. Well, most of them are not drunk. If it's dirt track racing, they probably are. But anyway, uh, they're weaving back and forth. It's not because they're drunk and it's not because they're a bad driver. You know what they're doing? They're preparing for the race especially in asphalt racing. They're trying to get those tires hot. They don't have any tread on them in most divisions. Southeast legends that run with us now, they do have some tread, but the rest of them have racing slicks on them. And what they're doing is they're weaving back and forth, trying to get those tires hot so that that rubber will get real tacky, so it'll get real sticky, so as they run the race, it'll hug the asphalt 
as tight as it can run. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with me as a Christian in running my race with godly honor and laying aside those things which easily beset us? Now, I'm going to say a lot more about that. But let me just say this. Every believer, every believer has a race to run, but every believer has some growing to do. Every believer has a time of preparation that God puts us through. And last night, Brother Shane got up and talked about all the difficulty of people going, their people are going through. Our dear brother's mother-in-law passed away. Others dealing with heart issues and others dealing with cancer and all these types of difficulties that are going on in our lives. Understand something. There is a reason. There, there is something going on greater than just our circumstance. And if we are going to successfully finish our race in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, we've got to understand that God will send us through things to prepare us for other things. You think about John the Baptist. How long was his ministry? Probably six months. But maybe, maybe three years. But more than likely, the ministry of John the Baptist was only six months. But John the Baptist was in the wilderness. And when he was in the wilderness, you know the Bible says he came out you know, clothed in camel hair and eating locusts. That's probably a nut that he was eating, not catching June bugs out of the air and guzzling down. All right, a locust in Bible lands is referring to more than likely a particular type of nut that he would have eaten. But John the Baptist, while he was in the wilderness, people would have thought, what's that man doing out there in the wilderness? That's an unusual place to be. He calls himself a, a voice of the Lord. I'll tell you what he was doing. God was preparing him for that six months, maybe three years of ministry, where when it was all said and done with, Jesus would say, there's never been a man greater born of a woman. His ministry was short, but his ministry was right. We could say it this way. His race was short, but his race was right. And in that time of preparation, he was submissive to the Lord's will in his life. And I'm here to tell you something. There needs to be a time of preparation where we just say, Lord, I want to get out there and I want to go fast. But right now, you got me running around getting heat in my tires. You got me under some caution laps getting ready. And I tell you, Lord, just give me the grace to endure it. Every now and then I'll see some young preacher boy. God will call him to preach and he'll get hungry and eager to preach. Of course, nowadays you don't see many young men being called to preach anymore. I'll be honest with you, I'm not for sure why that is. I got a feeling it's because there's not a whole lot of preaching going on in a lot of churches. And everybody would rather have you sit on a stool and just have a little conversation with you. I personally want to believe what the Bible says. That the foolishness of preaching which not only refers to the message, but also the delivery of the message. The delivery of the message is one of authority. You don't have to spit five rows like me. You don't have to raise your voice like me to be a preacher. But when a preacher stands up to preach the Word of God, we've got to understand that he's standing up on behalf of God as long as he's preaching the book of God. Therefore, he's under the authority of God. And neighbor, you just better hold whatever he says as long as it's part of the Word of God and you'll be responsible for it. There's authority from heaven behind it. Some of these young preacher boys, they, they, they just want to jump in and just go hog wild every now and then. I see somebody that wants to teach and they think that, man, they're the next great Bible teacher. But, but they don't want to prepare. They don't, they don't want to spend the time in the Word. They don't want to go through the preparation time. I, I know of some guys that want to be deacons that, that shouldn't be deacons. Why? They've only been a Christian for a little while. They're still too young in the faith. And, and there needs to be a time of preparation. There's just a lot that we have around the church that takes time for us to grow into doing certain things. we got to understand that. It's a time of preparation. The old caution flag. Boys, get ready. We're about to go race. Not long after, they've gone usually five laps for us with the super trucks. The flag going to reach over and grab the green flag. Everybody knows what the green flag means. We're fixing to really turn her loose and go. The flagman will get word. 
He'll get word in his headset, let's turn him loose. You've got to understand something. There's the owner of the race. There's also a guy called the race commander. You can't see him. The race commander is sitting up in the tower. He's in a booth tucked away. You don't even know he's there. You just experience what's going on. And that race commander will radio down to the flagman. And he'll say, all right, let's turn him loose the next lap. You know what that race commander, you know who he's a picture of? If the race owner is a picture of God the Father who owns the race, the race commander is a picture of Jesus. Because remember what we said last night, and I challenge you to go to John chapters 14, 15, and 16 and see it. The, Jesus said to the disciples, listen, the Holy Spirit's not going to talk about Himself. He's going to listen for what I tell Him, and He's going to tell you what I tell Him. And that race commander's in the tower, and he's a picture of the Lord Jesus, and he's calling the shots in the race, and that flagman is a picture of the Holy Spirit who's giving signals and warnings and commands from the flag stand to those who are racing. And so the, the, the race commander, he'll give the orders for the race to start. And the flag will reach out, and he'll usually hold up two flags, and he'll usually do them back and forth like this, that's a sign for those race car drivers to get side by side, and we're going racing in two laps. And then he'll take that yellow flag and usually he'll set it over to the side or something, and he'll get his green flag out, and if they're all lined up just right, and in the super truck series, if I'm down there in the start box, when they come into that start box, if they're side by side, not jumping out ahead of somebody else, not trying to win the race on the first lap, as long as they are side by side like they're supposed to be, and I don't say call them back, that flagman has the liberty to rear back and throw the green flag and off they go racing. Now, don't you understand something? When they start racing, there is an expected pace to that race. Let's go back to the word with me. Let's read it once again. Make sure we stay focused on the word here. He says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us. When that flagman drops that green flag, you'll notice they take off as fast as they can. Maybe not as fast as they can. That's probably not a true statement, but they take off pretty fast and most of them start getting jockeying for position. But inevitably, almost in every race, you'll see the flagman reach over and grab a flag that looks like this. Now, some of them have started using a blue flag with a red stripe. It just depends on the flag, but the flags mean the same thing. And they'll be up there watching the race, commanding the race, race commander in the tower, race owner, determining what this thing's going to be like, how many laps you run, who, how much money they win. you got everybody in place, and here's these, these racers out there racing, and they are expected to be at a certain pace, and if they're not, that fragment pulls out this flag. What he's going to do if a driver is out front and he's off or he's in anybody's way, if he's not up to the right pace, that flagman's going to take and wave this yellow and blue flag at him. And what he's saying is, hey, buddy, get over. You're blocking progress. You're hindering the race. And if that driver does not get over, more than likely that flagman is going to lean out with that flag and he may grab the edge of it. And when that driver comes by, he may point the end as in, Buster, you better get out of the way. We're fixing to take you off the track. You say, preacher, what in the world does that have to do with my spiritual life? Well, the plan of God and the race of God is that every believer be at the right pace. You see, this thing of being a Christian and being a part of the Christian community is not a thing of running solo. It is a thing of Christian community. And this thing of being a church member is a lot more than having your name on a roll book somewhere. Can I tell you something right now? We've, we've done ourselves a great disservice, especially in Southern Baptist rank, in the thinking somehow that that little piece of paper called my letter has some great value to it in the fact that the, it's a piece of paper. As a pastor, I've had men call me and say, Preacher, uh, I'd like to have my letter to take with me. And, I, and I've said, no, 
worry and joy. Well, I haven't, I haven't found a church just yet where I'm trying to join, but I'd like to have my letter so that I can give it to them when I do find a place to join. Do you know what that's called in Alabama? That's called hogwash. <laughs> We've got this idea of being a part of a church as a part of a country club. We got this idea that as long as my, I tell you what, I'm a member of I'm a member of Bethel Baptist Church. Can I translate that for some folks? I got the right to be buried in their cemetery. <laughs> hey, 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 can I transfer? Can I can I translate that a little bit further? Some folks, I tell you what, that's right. I'm a member of our Bethel Baptist Church. They hadn't been in six years. Some of them hadn't been in sixty years. But you know what they think? Because their name is on the roll of Bethel Baptist Church, they think that their name is on the roll of heaven. And can I tell you something? Putting your name on the roll of Bethel Baptist Church means that your name got put in ink on a piece of paper, and it should mean that you believe that it's the will of God for you to be here and to be a part of this church, and it should mean that you believe that it is the will of God for you to be submissive to the authority church and the leaders of this church and to be accountable to this church and for you to be a part of holding your brothers and sisters accountable it should mean that you're going to come and you're going to tithe and give offerings and serve and invite people to come and be on the safety team and be on the nursery team and teach Sunday school if it's God's will and sing in the choir if it's God's will. It should mean it should mean that it's about you being obedient to God and serving God where God has placed you. It should mean that not that you've got this right to be here. Now I tell you what, preacher, I'm a member of Bethel Baptist Church. Oh, my granddaughter don't give a flip for God. She wants to get married to some old husband that's nothing more than a drunk. At least I got a place for her to have a wedding. Hello? Amen. I tell you, that's all I remember about the Baptist Church. When I die, they're going to put that in that old bitch where I'm going to have my family call Brother Shane. I'm going to have Brother Shane to make sure Brother Shane preaches my funeral. Want to say something good, Brother John? Translation. I live like the devil. I'm going to cause that man. No, I'm not going to cause it. I'm going to be a part of tempting that man to lie about me. He ain't going to lie about you. And I tell you right now, if I was preaching this funeral, I ain't going to sugarcoat nothing either. In fact, if you ain't got fruit to show that you're saved, I might tell the Lord hallelujah here in heaven. I'm just going to preach on how you should be there. Yes. Amen? Amen? Church membership. Well, I could preach all night on that. I'm telling you, it's crazy. Being a member of a church means that you're a part of the body of Christ. And that you're meant to be a part of this team. It's not Shane's show. It's not a brother. I'm going blank all of a sudden. Trey, it's not Trey's show. It's not Rick's show. Though we do have Hollywood in the balcony today, that's for sure. <laughs> it's not about our show. It's all about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is the race commander. Hello? And he's got a pace for you to run your race. And if you're not running your race at the right pace, well, we said, what right pace? I cannot determine your spiritual pace. But you should be growing in grace. You should be serving somehow. You say, well, preacher, I'm too old. I'm slowing down. I understand. And there's plenty of room for drivers that run races that are slowing down. We call it the Carolina, well now we call it the Southeast Vintage Series. That means we let the guys who like to go slower race at a different time, but they still get to rest. They drive them older cars that a lot of you think are great classics, you know, 57 Chevys and you know all those. We even got a guy that drives a 51 Hudson, I believe it is. But, but, but they got their time for their race. You still run the race. Get in the race. In other words, grow in grace. Serve. Don't sit on the sidelines and don't sit soaking sour. Serve God. Hello? Serve God. Ma'am, what ministry are you in? Sir, what ministry are you in? Are you serving?
serving God? Are you running the race at the right pace? Doing something. Not waiting for something to happen, but serving God now. <coughs> Notice he said, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. You know why most Christians aren't running the race at the right pace? It's because sin is weighing down their life. And the number one sin of Christians, and many, or should I say the number one sin of church people, is really idolatry. With a close second of pride. We, we, we have idols in our life that must be repented of and forsaken. We have things that we set up in our lives that we think are more important than serving God. Our reputation, our comfort. You know, last night we talked about the crying of babies in the church and how that sounds. I don't want to give that illustration again. It irritated me again thinking this morning about it. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, the, the, the pace that God has for believers, it, it, you're not just to sort of put around and, and cause havoc for other people. You're to be serving God. I believe with all my heart that tonight somebody will see the yellow and blue flag waved by the Holy Spirit in their heart and mind because they know that in reality they're not running the race at the right pace. They're not serving God the right way. And this flag, it doesn't mean that you can't be out there on the track, but it does mean you've got to get out of the way. Amen. Yes. Come on, Let me say that one again. When you got too much weight holding you back and you can't run at the right pace, you got to get out of the way. Yeah. The truth of the matter is, there's a lot of badness to hold the church back. Amen. Church of God, Nazarene, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Methodist too. Amen. Truth of the matter is, there's some folks running around, they're weighted down, they're weighted down by mama's religion. They're weighted down by mama's ideology. They're weighted down by grandpa's thinking. We got a man that I, I hear about in our church all the time. I hear he's a great man, did a lot of good things. But, but they keep telling me about this man and what they convey to me more than him loving God and being sweet and doing right, Brother John. I keep hearing stories about how that if he saw a boy and I, they walk into the church building, he'd walk up and just take the hat off the boy no matter what. He made the head usher. He made the head usher make him a promise. He said he was the head usher. And before he would turn it over to this other guy, he was getting too old to be there, and was running out of steam. He said, now before I give you this head usher, well, number one, it wasn't his to give away. But number two, he said, since I, I'll give you this head usher's position, but you've got to make me a promise that at no time in your life will you ever let ushers usher without a coat and tie I showed up. All these guys had coats and ties. I'm not against coats and ties. I think the guy that invented the tie ought to be hung from the nearest tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tie tonight because I know your preacher wears a tie coat. Y'all forgive me when I'm at home. I, I usually don't wear a tie. Y'all forgive me, all right? I did something. Though. I'm back in good graces, had a bunch of Anyway, these guys would come walking down the aisle. They look like secret service agents. <laughs> Standing on the front row. I'm up there, you know, I'm up there with this plea. Hey man, we ought, to, we ought to believe God and give our tithe and serve Lord. I went to the head of the I said, man, get them funeral home to let funeral home directors. You're a funeral home director, I'm trying to get the funeral home directors down there to liven up a little bit, man. I'm not against coats and ties, but I'm telling you right now, that guy, they tell me about it, he was just so adamant on everything. Well, guess what? We are in the ghetto where our church is. We got kids that I had to buy shoes for a couple of months ago when it was 15 degrees outside. They were showing up at church with flip flops and shorts on. I, I'm, I'm not going to keep giving that illustration. I'm, I'm going to move on a little bit more. But that guy, I hear about it. And, and I just said this somebody the other day. I said, listen, man, I'm all for doing right and, you know, being appropriate. 
The next sounds like me. Me and him would have butted heads because he was more concerned about getting his way and, and holding things back than letting God, letting people come that need to be saved. Yeah, and I'm telling you, sometimes we'll be running our race in church life, and we'll get in the way of other. We'll get in the other way of other cars, so to say, other believers that are trying to serve God and run the race at their pace, but because it causes us to get uncomfortable about something. And the Holy Spirit the whole time said, hey, get over it, buddy, you're running too slow. What do we do? <laughs> See, I've been bad just all my life, John. That's why I know how to act. <laughs> trying to tell you, listen, wake up, smell the coffee, get in line with the Word, don't be holding everything back. As long as everybody's being faithful to the Word, it's okay. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but as long as we're faithful to the Word, it'll be alright. The Holy Spirit's been waving the, the yellow and the blue flag at you, but now it's the black flag and what's coming down the pipe for you is, He's going to take you out of the way. Everybody wants to talk about how much God loves everybody, and He does. But my friend, the Bible teaches us whom He loves, He chastens. And a black flag is a chastening. That's when God says, all right, Buster, you wouldn't deal with it when I gently, when I gently told you you're running off the pace. Now I'm going to deal with it even more harshly. And I said a while ago that, that if you don't get off the track in three laps, guess what's going to happen? That race commander is going to tell the flagman, throw the red flag. And whenever that red flag comes out, everybody's stopping. They're not going to be anybody racing. And when that red flag comes out, guess what? I got deputies coming with me to your car. It's not just a big boy chaplain coming. It's me and the deputies coming. And you are going to leave the track. You're not just going to leave and go work on it in the pits, are you, John? You're going to leave the track, period. You're going to load it up. You're going to put it on the trailer. You go into the house. You may cuss all the way, but we're going to celebrate waving at you as you go out the gate. Hello? Spiritual application. That I'll tell you. 
Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. And God is so good and so merciful. Whenever we have things that are hindering us in our life, He says, deal with it. That's not right. Confess it. That's not right. Repent of it. That's not right. Go get it right with your brother or your sister. That's not right. Maybe it may be that for a period of time you need to step over and step out of the way. You know what that head usher, uh, that, that man that died, I never met him, but I heard about him, so you got you can't be, I'll bet you be head usher if you'll make a promise that you'll always have men in coat and ties as ushers. I went to that man and I said, now listen, we got a bunch of guys in this church who don't wear coats and ties. But they come dressed appropriately for church. Let them usher. You know what that man did? He said, Preacher, I love you and I even agree with you. But because I made a promise to a man, I can't go back on my word. I wish I hadn't made the promise. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step down, but I'm going to keep serving. And you let Joe Clevenger or Bill Robertson be the head of usher, and I'll help them. And he is like a right arm to me in our church. Man has a sweet spirit. The man is kind and considerate. And so out of integrity, he stepped down as the head usher, but he just keeps helping. He's just not the man making the usher order. And the other guy is willing to be balanced. And, and so he just slid over. I'll tell you what happens to the average Baptist church. <laughs> I can't do what right now. I'm taking my wrist hard and going home. Hello? Huh? I'm going home. Fragment don't like me. Preacher don't like me. No, man, God, the Holy Spirit gives you a chance to deal with things in your life. And maybe you just need to slide over a little bit, deal with those things, and maybe you can come back and serve God. And, and, and here's something else. Whenever you and I have sin in our lives, and the sweet spirit of God is saying, repent, get it right, get it right, get it right. He gets, he gets more and more firm with us in His speaking to our hearts. And, and whenever we ignore getting things right, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And guess what? Just like Pharaoh who hardened his heart, after he hardened his heart the first time, then the Lord started hardening his heart. Not people don't like to hear this. But it's just the truth. After Pharaoh hardened his heart the first time, God started hardening his heart the second time so that God could set it up for the big showdown and show the little boy he's not a big boy and that the big one can have the little one. And there come a day where Pharaoh said, Take it all, man. Y'all get out of here. Why did he do that? And Pharaoh wasn't a Christian, but God even demonstrated mercy to Pharaoh. And for his children, for Christians, God says, man, get right. God's not, God's not looking for a chance to part your hair with a lightning bolt. God takes no place. Some of you don't have hair to part. <laughs> God's not trying to do anything bad to hurt you. He loves you enough, though, to chase you. And if you don't get out of the way, and you know what? Here's what happens. Inevitably, somebody who won't get off the track with a yellow and blue flag and won't get off the fl track with a black flag, almost inevitably, they get red flagged not while they're still running. They get red flagged because they cause a wreck and we have to clean up a bigger mess. Amen. Hey, sir, you think that pornography you're fooling around with is just between you and God, you keep letting that slide and you're going to wreck your family. Ma'am, you think that fooling around with that guy at your office is sweet on you and speaking kind words to you? And you know what it used to be? You thought, well, that's just the young thing. Hey, brother John, uh -huh. Trust me, 60 and older are doing that stuff nowadays. Hello? You think, well, it's okay for him to come over. I, I let him speak kind words to me and say stuff my husband will never know. I'm going to tell you something. you got a red flag coming. Amen. Hello? Amen. How about a church member? I, you know what? I wouldn't ask for the shame for any church problems for no amount of money. 
Because I want to get up here and if the Spirit of God says throw it in overdrive, load both barrels and pull the trigger at the same time and go as hard as you can, I want that kind of freedom. So I don't know your list of problems. I'm telling you right now. But in the church house, if you don't deal with bitter spirits and attitudes, if you don't deal with haughtiness, I'm telling you right now, sooner or later, you're going to have a red flag even on this church. Well, they'll be racing. Some want to race. You'll see the flag will reach up. you see the flag will grab most of the time the yellow and blue flag. He'll reach up and he'll fold them up like this usually. And he'll lean out over the edge of that flag stand. He'll tie them together and do this <coughs> You know what he's saying? Boys, we're halfway done with this race. Can I say this in all kindness? As I look around this auditorium, I see some that are just starting their race out with the Lord. But I see a whole bunch. You're way past your halfway mark. That includes me. Hello? It was a sobering thought to me. I'm 50 years old, man. I'm headed for the fourth quarter. I want to finish strong. I want to finish right. I'm headed for the fourth quarter. I'm just about there. And there's a bunch of you with me. You're way past that halfway. <laughs> what's the application? How's your race going? You call yourself a Christian, are you? If you are, how's your race going? Are you serving God? Are you on pace? Are you out there running like it should be run? Are you out there considering other drivers? By the way, if you run a race without considering other drivers, you cause all kind of havoc. If you run a race without considering other drivers, you will not win like you should. Toward in the race, you see the flag will reach over. He'll grab the green flag. He'll grab the white flag. Whenever this, whenever this starts taking place, I mean things pick up. Excitement picks up. Y'all remember Ernie Irvin, you NASCAR fans? Remember Ernie Irvin? Ernie's boy, I believe his name Jerry, came to Anderson Motor Speedway, and I was working the race over there. Beginning of the race. Jerry sitting up on the pole. Man, the green flag drops. He starts falling back. One car after another passed him. You can hear people in the pits saying, what's going on with him, man? He, he must be losing it. It must be falling off. Falling off a racing turn for his car. Losing horsepower. Maybe losing grip. Well, flags came out halfway mark. It was not long after halfway. He starts passing him. This car, and next lap you pass the next car, and next lap you pass the next car. Well, the flagman reaches up and grabs these two flags and leans out over the edge. He does this number. That means boys, or it does this number. Boys, we got two laps left. He typically will put that green flag down and have this white one. Now, what does that mean? When that white one comes out, that means there's one. Lap left. Some of us may be on our last lap tonight. Some of us might be like this dear brother's mother-in-law. The doctor yesterday, as I understand it, said we're taking her off of hospice care. We believe she's going to recover. And she died at 1 o'clock this morning. When that doctor uttered those words, thinking she was going on further and had more laps, the white flag was being waved in heaven. Tonight's invitation may be your white flag. Tonight may be the last lap for some of you to be able to be saved. Tonight might be the last opportunity for some of you to repent 
of that sin that the Spirit of God has been troubling you about. Tonight might be the last lap. Don't leave this world without being right. Irvin's boy picked him off, picked him off, picked him off, and when that flagman waved that white flag, everybody that knows anything about racing knows what's going to happen. Irvin's boy is sitting in second place. He dives off into turn number one on the last lap. Pulls up close to the guy in front of him. Stays right on his rear bumper out of turn number two. Goes down the back chute just as hard as he could go. It looked like he was almost pushing him. Goes into turn number three and he does what is acceptable in racing unless your last name is Bush or, uh, well anyway, I won't even do that. Uh, goes what's acceptable in racing he gives him a little bump just a shove, just a nudge not enough to lift his tires off the back off the ground, but just enough to, to, to bump him and get that rear end of that car just a little bit loose and that first place car slid up the track, he didn't wreck he just slid up, lost a little bit of grip and Irvin's boy cut left went low, and whenever the checkered flag come out and was waving, guess who is in the pit standing right next to me, crying like a baby. Ernie Irvin. His boy just run, won his first big boy race. One lap left in our life. One lap. You better be ready. The finish is coming and the finish may come tonight. Is everything right between you and God? Have you run your race the right way? You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Have you obeyed God? Have you done the will of God? Is your spirit right? Is your heart right? Some of you may not realize this flag right here is not just for winners. Everybody thinks that's just for winners. Uh -uh. This means the race is over. It's only the winner that gets to wave it and ride around and burn his tires off and ride around and do a, what they call a, a victory lap, backwards victory lap. Somebody calls it Polish lap, whatever. I don't care. But guess what? Everybody that runs under this, this flag means something to them. Next time NASCAR's racing, you, you watch them. Get down to the end of the race. Now, if the end of the race is during church, watch it on DVR after church, all right? Did you hear me? Preacher, I said it. Watch it on DVR after church. Don't you sit at home. Don't you come tell me, say, well, Preacher, you brought that big fat guy in from revival. He said to me to watch the post-race interviews. And it was going on during church, so I just didn't what the evangelist said. Watch it on DVR. They'll go up there and they'll stick a microphone on somebody's face and they'll, they'll run to the, the guy that's coming in fifth place. Well, what do you have to say about it? And he'll get, put that microphone in and say, well, I'll tell you what, I want to thank our sponsors. And he'll stop, he'll turn a Coca-Cola bottle where you can see Coca-Cola. You know what he's doing? He's feeling the money going into his bank again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what's happening. That's why I drink water after a race. <laughs> Ain't no money going in. Well, I don't think I'll go long thing. My boy, I tell you, my team gave me a good car, and he's just standing there happy he got to race. Happy he got to run. <laughs> They'll run the second place guy. Well, I wish I could have got up there. My boys gave me a good car. I was close, but I just couldn't get it off the turns. But I tell you what, we had a good race, and I sure am happy about it. You see, all those racers that got to finish, they're happy. One level or another, they're happy. And you know what the good thing is in the race that God has for us? It's the finishing that counts. It's the finishing. Because if you finish, God says you're a winner. If you finish the race, you're a winner. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's, it, it's not like, you know, modern days everybody gets a trophy. But in heaven, there is the satisfaction of knowing you finish your race. Hello? You going to finish it well? You don't run your race right. You, there's always somebody in the race. There's always somebody in the race that gets impatient. 
There's always somebody that gets impatient and whenever this flag gets thrown, they determine that they need to really work hard. That they, they gotta get out there and they gotta try to get up front right away and stay up front right away. And, 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 and what happens in every race, what happens in every race is, dude, why don't we just leave this over here? What happens in every race is, is this thing called race and stripes. You know what I'm talking about? That's where another car bumps you, hits you. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. But another car will bump you or hit you, slide you sideways, sometimes it causes a wreck. Most of the time, those things don't happen because somebody's trying to be mean. It happens just because it's part of racing and people get on the gas, off the gas at certain times and hit a bump. Man, if you're running Newport and dive off and or even Kingsport, man. Kingsport turn one. Woo! You're off for a ride. I mean, it's like riding on a dirt road in the middle of that turn up there. One and two. Things happen. And people get racing stripes. And, and almost every race, somebody who gets a racing stripe gets mad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> And they're on the radio, they're saying words that we're not going to repeat and he really shouldn't be saying. Mm, what they do, they, they, they determine that they're going to work their way back up through the field and they're going to find the guy that gave them a racing stripe and they're going to make sure that that guy knows how it feels to get a racing stripe. And so they just, they forget about finishing the race. They forget about running the race the way it's supposed to be run and they determine that their life goal, their race goal is to make sure that the guy that gave him a racing strike gets it back and so and he tries to retaliate and nine out of ten times it causes one of these. And not only did he not win the big money but now his crew's got to work all week long to put her back together in the shop because he retaliated. When all he had to do was just say, all right, hey, listen, it's part of racing. It'll come back another time. Let me at least take home some pretty decent money from finishing the race. How does that apply to us? looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The other day, in fact a week ago Sunday, one of our inactive deacons, our deacons rotate, they're not lifetimers, only people who have lifetimers are in prison. <laughs> That's supposed to be funny. Everybody's supposed to laugh. Anyway, one more day because it's inactive. He came and he said, Preacher, Gary called me. His son got a four wheeler accident at 1 o'clock in the morning, and there's a 50, 50 chance he's going to live or die. He said, and Gary's mad at God. Gary got a racing stripe. And what did he do? Aiming for God. That's stupid. That's foolish. Somebody on the other end of the road hurts your feelings. If you're not careful, the devil will sow a seed of bitterness in your heart. And it'll just sit there and it'll brew and it'll brew and it'll brew. And what you'll do is you'll sit there in the service and rather than listening to the Word of God and being sensitive to the Spirit of God, you have on your mind. Something will happen in life that you just don't understand. You just don't think it's fair from God. And you just, you just hold on to it. And rather than having faith and believing the Word of God, when it says that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to His purpose, rather than believing God and His Word, what you'll do is, I tell you what, I can't believe God would do something like that to me. I give an offer when I come to church. I pay my bills. <laughs> he 
You're going to destroy your life, your family's life. And you'll sow seeds of discord in this church that have been worse than cancer ever thought about them. What does God say? Consider Him that endured the contradiction of sinners. Hey, can I tell us all the truth? It was me and you that gave Jesus race and stripes. We bumped him in the corner, lifted his rear wheels off, spun him out, then drove him into the wall, backed up, cussed at him, and drove off. That's what we did to Jesus. Jesus hanging on the cross. It's not because of the guy that's in the MS-13 game that's, uh, that's killing and stealing and I. It's, it's not just because of his sin. It's because of my sin and your sin. It's my pride and my arrogance and my inconsideration and my rudeness and my lack of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It was, hey, listen, I brought God of the tithe before. It was my robbing God of the tithe years ago. It was my sin they hung him on the cross. I gave him race and stripes and so did you. And some, no doubt, are giving him race and stripes even tonight. Because in your mind, you're thinking, man, I can't wait that fat boy shuts up so I can't go on the home. You know what that's called? A cold heart. And you need to repent in your life. And consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners. I wish I could tell you that the ministry was always pleasant. It's not. I wish I could tell you that marriage is always pleasant. It's not. I offend my wife, my wife offends me. I wish I could tell you that having children is always pleasant. They don't always do what makes mom and daddy happy. Hey, why don't we just humble ourselves before God and quit whining? Quit complaining and realize none of us have ever or will ever go through what Jesus Christ went through for our sake. Consider Him lest you be weary. You say, well, I just can't take it no more. And I understand that feeling. But consider Him. Tonight, one. Are you in the race? I'll close with this. We're done. <coughs> Let's say Brother Shane gets all motivated. He's heard the sermon tonight. He said, I tell you what, Jim. I'm coming to Kingsport. I'm racing with the Southeast Super Trucks. He goes and buys him a Bell Racing helmet. He doesn't get a white one. He gets one with flames painted on it. <laughs> he gets him a black racing suit with black skull gloves like Dale Jr. raced in the last year. He was racing. A bone gloves. He would have a tie on though while he was racing. <laughs> I didn't preach against thighs now. Remember that shame? No, <laughs> Man, he steps out of the truck. He's got a big old holler he's bought. He talks several deacons into being part of his pit crew. <laughs> he steps out of the truck, goes up there, pays his fees to be part of the Southeast Super Truck Series, buys his license, pays for his crew to get in the pits, pulls that big rig hauler down there in the pits, crew jumps out, Shane looking sharp, black racing suit, got him some, some bone gloves. He got him some, some red racing shoes that have some extra things on there so he looks real snazzy. Goes back there and he pulls the back door of his hauler down and lays it down and inside is a John Deere 175. <laughs> got a question for you. Is he going to race? <laughs> the 
know why? The man that owned the race put in the rope up. You got to have two inch roll cage, racing slicks, safety net, seat, all the, all the works. God wants you to race tonight. I want you to race all the way to heaven. But his rule book says, you must be born again. Amen. Amen. To be born again means that you acknowledge that you are a sinner. Amen. You turn to God in repentance and faith and believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross in rising from the grave, Amen. that He can forgive you and save you. When you believe on Jesus Christ, God then deposits His life in you. Amen. You become a believer. Can you even take the green flag? Are you even eligible for the race? If you're not, would you believe on Christ tonight? If you are a Christian, are you running your race? No sin holding you back. Looking at Jesus saying, no matter what happens, I'm going to finish in the Lord. I'm going to go all the way. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It's time for us to do business with God. Tonight, is there somebody here that say, Preacher, I'm not a Christian. I'm not even eligible for the race. I have never been repented and believed on Jesus Christ. I beg that you come to Christ tonight. Believe on Him right now. Is there someone here that would like for us to pray with you to help you understand how you can become a Christian. While Christians are praying all over the auditorium, would you just quietly be willing to come up here and take the pastor by his hand? We're not asking you to come talk and give speech. We're asking you to be saved tonight. We're asking you to believe on Jesus. We're asking you to get in the race that he's prepared for you. If you're not a Christian, would you come even right now Get up where you are and make your way forward and believe on Jesus Christ. There could be somebody here that you can't even get a, maybe you get a physical problem. You can't walk. But you need to be saved. Would you call on Christ from where you sit right there? Would you confess to Him that you're a sinner? Confess to Him that you believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the grave in resurrection power. Confess to God that you believe in Jesus and you're willing to follow Him the rest of your life. Would you be saved by where you are if you cannot come? I wonder how many of us are Christians and we'd just get honest tonight and say we know that God has spoken to our heart. There's something that needs to be corrected. And we need to get it right. I've got a yellow and blue flag, or maybe he's been waving the black or red flag at me, and I can't go any farther. I've got to get right. Quit resisting the work of God and get right tonight. So we have this invitation. Would you please be obedient to God? The altar is open. Maybe you're right with God as best you know how, but you know you need to come and pray for someone. Would you please do that tonight? Not so that we can have a response, but because we need to respond tonight. We need to be obedient to the Word of God and the wooing of the Spirit of God in our lives. Would you stand at your feet? Brother Shane is going to take the invitation. You be obedient. <laughs> Across the 
front here. Guess what? Maybe you just want to come and take them by the hand and let them just pray with you tonight. But you know what we have in common? We're all in a race. Is it God's race or ours? Chips provided so well the illustration for us to be in God's race. Time's come and gone, but we, this may be the last night on earth any of us have. We've got time to take four or five minutes here to be about God's business. We were honest with each other, and most importantly, honest with God. Most, if not all, would say, you know what, I need help from time to time running my race. I believe that's one reason God gave us brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want you to answer my invitation. I don't want you to answer Chip's. I don't want you to neglect the Holy Spirit's invitation. These men stand ready to pray with you as you just come and say, let's pray together. You don't have to explain. All you want to do is pray. We all need strength and encouragement. Because we either have been in dark times, we're in dark times, or dark times may be coming. And Jesus has said he'll be with us even to the end of the age. I'm through. But God's not. How many people would say, you know what, I am one of those flags that he's described. How many would say, you know what, I've got a son, a daughter, a spouse, a grandparent, a grandchild. I'm going to go and pray for it. Let these deacons join with you and pray. I suspect all don't care that it's 804. Because we're learning and growing and yearning towards a time when time ends and eternity begins. Don't let this moment pass. God, work your perfect will. As our dear brother sings and ministers to us in song. Help us to continue to pray and see your face and step out and come and say, let's pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. As he sings, you'll be obedient. Oh.